Plain Spoken, Episode 13. Welcome back to Plain Spoken. My name is Dean Abbott, and I wanted to um, sit down tonight and talk with you a little bit. Uh, back in at Christmas time, uh, one of my friends, a friend, gave me a a mug, and it is designed to look like the mug is wearing a cable knit sweater. And we are almost to the end of the cold part of the year, and I thought I might try to get one more use out of it as I'm drink making and drinking some hot tea tonight. Um, I'm a little bit particular about tea. It's got to be not too hot, not too cold. So I have a mug sitting here, uh, and if so if you hear me slurping, you'll know why. So as I said, my name is Dean Abbott, and I want to start this episode by telling you that you can find me on Twitter, at Dean Abbott. Um, you can follow me there, you can DM me, direct message me, or you can email me at dean at deanabbott.com. I am doing uh, this podcast kind of irregular, irregularly, if you haven't heard it before, I'm doing it Right now, kind of as the mood strikes, I think this is the second one I've done this week, though. If you have any interest in material created with a focus primarily on Christian women, which uh, clearly I am not, um, I would recommend to you the Sally Clarkson podcast. I don't listen to every episode, but I do listen to it sometimes because I am kind of in awe of her podcasting abilities. The way she just seems to sit down, turn on her microphone, start talking, telling a story about her children and this or that and where she's traveling and and sort of weaving it all together with apparently no script, no notes, but she sounds just like she's talking directly to you as an individual. And it's sort of like it's sort of like watching Michael Jordan uh, play basketball. Her skills are kind of at that level, and I'm hoping to get mine uh, to that level as well. Well, that's quite an aspiration, but I'm trying to improve them. What I'd like to be able to do is just to sit down here and talk to you casually. Right now, I probably spend too much time making notes for these episodes. So I feel like if I can get away from the note making, I'd be able to do these more freely and more frequently without investing a lot of that uh, time up front. So that's the purpose of this series of podcasts that I'm currently doing. I wanted to tell you too that I started something new this week, something I'm kind of excited about. I get uh, lots of requests uh, on Twitter or via email for attention and help and people who want to talk with me about things they're struggling with. And, and of course, I love that. That's one of the best things about being on social media in my view. However, it does get a little bit overwhelming at times and to the point where I feel like, well, I can't really focus on any individual and give that person really the level of attention that he or she needs to be able to cope with the problem they're, they've presented to me. And so this week I set up what the infrastructure I needed to start doing hour-long consultations with people. So basically during these consultations, I help people solve problems. Usually they're problems related to mindset, relationship issues, or lifestyle problems that are troubling them. And this week I did a few, and they went really well. It's really amazing to see someone move in the space of an hour from feeling weighed down by a problem to being able to go through a paradigm shift and from that paradigm shift, start making action plans for new ways that they are going to tackle this obstacle in front of them. And it's very gratifying to me. And as far as I could tell from for those people I spoke to this week, it was gratifying and helpful for them. 
If you are interested maybe in talking with me uh, about any of this, you can find out how to schedule with me by visiting my Twitter profile or by emailing me. Um, that's again, my email is dean at deanabbott.com. You can, I, I will, if I am able, I will also put a link to the calendar where you can um, book a session, uh, an hour with me in the show notes if I'm able to do that. I'm not sure yet how Anchor works that, but if I can, I will. Tonight, I wanted to tell you some stories and then to talk about something I heard on another podcast this week and finally try to tie those together and make a couple of points about about those stories and, uh, and specifically about some bad advice I heard this week from Dr. Laura Schlesinger and uh, Suzanne Vinker and how those that bad advice, I think, leads to shame and repression and particularly leads men to grow up into situations where they are not really fully free as individuals. Mm, excuse me, that's good tea. Uh, all right, so I grew up in Indiana in the 1970s and the 1980s. And in that era, the figure who loomed large over really half of Indiana, okay? I grew up in central Indiana from there all the way down to the Kentucky border. Bobby Knight was revered, okay? Bobby Knight was the head coach of the Indiana University basketball team during that time. And there was an incident, and you may know this, or it may have been so far before your time that you've never heard of it, but he was at a game, uh, a basketball game. I believe it was um, like a playoff game, maybe something like that. It was not, I don't think it was just like your standard seasonal game. And he got angry, as he always did. But in this one, he um, got angry and grabbed a chair from the sidelines and threw it out onto the floor of the basketball court, interrupting everything. And, of course, this made major headlines. It was all over the news. It was, uh, it was discussed at great length. He was a role model for people, and I suspect he was a role model for another man, uh, this one whom I knew personally. Uh, when I was a child, I was, I was 12 probably, not quite 13 yet. I was in seventh grade. During that year, I witnessed uh, one of my teachers beat one of my peers. I was in gym class, and um, I was the last boy to leave the locker room because in those days we had to change our clothes and go through all of this to go to physical education. I don't know if students still do that or not. But uh, I was in there finishing tying my shoes, I think, um, when another boy walked back into the locker room from the gym where we had our class. And right behind him came our gym teacher. Now, the other boy was probably also 12. Maybe he was 13. And he was a troubled boy for sure, From uh, probably from a family where there was lots and lots of trauma and poverty. Right behind him as he marched into the locker room came our teacher. Our male teacher, we had two teachers in that class, a male and a female. So he comes rushing in behind this student, and he says to me, I'm getting ready to walk out, and he says, don't you leave. He says to me, you stand right there. I want you to see this. So I was standing in the doorway between the locker room and the little hallway that led into the gym, and I could see all everyone in both everyone in my class, in the, in the gym, and I could see everything happening in the locker room. So our teacher is screaming and screaming at this little boy, 
and telling him that the law says that he can do anything to that boy to make him obey. Well, apparently what he thought he needed to do that day was to pick this boy up and repeatedly slam him into the metal lockers in that room, right? Uh, to just slam, swear at him, scream at him, and slam him uh, into these lockers again and again and again. And the boy is, you know, well, he's acting like somebody who's being attacked by a man three times his size and who's being, uh, 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 is acting like a boy who's being beaten. He can't fight back. He's totally powerless. He's totally humiliated. And he's hurt. At the same time, I can see everyone in, as I said, everyone in my class who's standing just on the other side of the wall, and they can hear everything that's happening. And our uh, adult female teacher in the class stood there and did nothing. Well, all this came to mind again, and as you can imagine, it's you know, it's it's a it's an it's an incident that sticks in my memory pretty strongly. It all came to mind again this week as I was listening to the Suzanne Vinker podcast. I decided to start listening to her show. I'd heard about her, and you know, and I think she has some some good things to say. And I went back to listen to the first episode, and she had a guest. Do you know who Dr. Laura Schlesinger is? You 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 probably do. She is a a radio talk show host who gives advice on personal matters. She um, she was quite popular in the 90s where when she was on hundreds of terrestrial radio stations and in recent years has withdrawn somewhat from public view. She is still doing a radio show on Sirius XM, but it is not, you know, it's subscriber only. It's not nearly as high profile as... It once was, and she's written many, many books. If you don't know who she is, she's that's who she is, and and she's famous for her caustic uh, and often quite rude style of giving advice to her callers. So, I was listening to this podcast in which Suzanne Vinker had Dr. Laura on as a guest. And Dr. Laura told this story about how a caller had called up once, it was, and it was a 13-year-old boy calling with his mother. And the 13-year-old boy was saying, I don't like to go to soccer practice because my coach, is, he screams, he yells, he, he's very, he berates us, he berates me whenever I don't do what he thinks I should do, and... Um, Basically, this coach is just harsh and um, belittling, really, to this boy. Well, Dr. Laura um, says to him, well, when you do what your coach says, do you become a better soccer player? And the boy says, yeah. And he says, she says, well, when, you, when he tells you to run this way and you run this way, do you get better? And the boy said, yeah. And then he says, well, when he tells you to um, kick in this way, do you get better? And the boy says, yes. And so she says, look, you got to be, you got to toughen up. And I want you to go to your soccer coach next time you have practice and say, thank you for being tough on me and making me a better player. And she and Suzanne then went into a discussion of how you know, basically, this is important because men have to be tough. And um, we have a big problem in this country where men don't act like men. And uh, really, they, they need to, basically, boys need to go through a situation, I guess, where adult men are screaming at them um, in order to really become men. Well... I found Dr. Laura's response appalling. Essentially, she just justified abuse on the basis of the need for men to be tough. All right, so I don't deny that 
men need to be tough. Life demands a certain kind of toughness from all of us. Okay, we all go through things that are difficult, and we all have to develop a a capacity for endurance, and we all have to um, be able to stick to situations sometimes when they are difficult. And an inability to do that is always going to lead to greater difficulty. Okay, no one's disputing any of that. However, her insinuation that somehow the I should tell you this too. She said uh, that Dr. Laura said that during the call, the boy's mother said, well, he's just not used to that tone. And Dr. Laura quite proudly said, so I just ignored that. Um, And that because apparently the tone that the coach used is somehow irrelevant to the situation in Dr. Laura's view. Okay. Uh, It's not at all irrelevant in, um, in my view, because the insinuation of her advice and of her saying, of her saying that she ignored the mother's concern about the coach's tone, the insinuation there is that somehow the fact that her caller was a boy means he has to accept abuse, and that is wrong. No one, whether boy, girl, man, or woman, is obligated to accept abuse. Basically, Dr. Laura was telling this boy to push down his emotions and to pretend that they aren't real for the sake of being a better soccer player. This is the genesis of a shame in a lot of men. Being told that their natural desire to get away from and to protect themselves from abuse when you tell a man that that part of himself, the part that the impulse to protect himself, when you tell him that that's weak or soft or wrong, that is shaming. And it creates lifelong distrust of his own inner impulses to protect. It, it creates a fissure between what he knows inwardly He should do what he knows inwardly is right for him and these sorts of expectations that have been inculcated in him by people who are, well, basically who are thinking in a very shallow way about these topics. And so the the expectations of people like Dr. Laura are at, become at odds with his inner impulses, his inner knowing of what is right and wrong, and he's torn between those. Now, for most of the rest of his life, what he's going to do is try to push down his inward knowledge of what's right and wrong, what's good for him, what ought to happen, um, how he ought to behave, where he needs to stand up for himself, where he can uh, accept, you know, certain compromises. There's going to be a, he's going to push all that down. And instead, he's going to start thinking, well, what would basically the Dr. Laura's of the world say that they expect from me? Now, granted, the situation with this soccer coach might seem mild, but he's not that different from my 7th grade gym teacher who beat that boy. The principle is the same. It's only a matter of degree, right? The, um, the principle of I can do whatever it takes to get the result from you that I want is the same in both situations. Not only is this advice that Dr. Laura gave shaming, it's also misleading about the fundamental nature of masculinity. Okay? So at the heart of masculinity is not toughness for toughness sake. It's not just I'm going to be tough because tough it's good to be tough. Nor is it a willingness to accept abuse and pretend that it doesn't hurt. 
at the heart of masculinity is the willingness to be self-directed. That's the first part. So what a mature man does is he has a mission and a vision for himself, which he is pursuing. When people like Dr. Laura refuse to validate a 13-year-old boy's sense that he's being violated, that his boundaries are being violated, that he's being mistreated, when, when people like Dr. Laura will not validate that, it makes it hard later in life for him to, as I said, trust his inner sense of direction, his inner sense of right and wrong, his inner sense of where his boundaries are. And when he can't do that, he can't be self-directed. He can't say, I know based on what is in my soul where I need to go. I know from within what my mission is. And he cannot then connect with that in a way that motivates him, that powers him to overcome obstacles to get to that mission. And so... To say he needs to toughen up and just accept abuse from the coach because he wants to be a better soccer player is, well, it's such a a misunderstanding of what is at the core of masculinity. I don't even know how to describe it. It's not only is it not about positive masculinity, it is, in fact, uh, inimical to positive masculinity. It's the opposite. Okay, so that's one thing that's at the core of mature, healthy masculinity is self-direction, an an ability to be connected with your inner impulses, your inner knowledge, your inner guidance. Also, one other thing that's at the heart of healthy, positive masculinity is an impulse to protect oneself and others from people who would violate the boundaries within which they are meant to operate. And that kid, when he's complaining about his coach, that is what he is trying to do. He is trying to establish and protect boundaries for himself. He's not being weak. He's not being soft. He's not wrong. He's right, and he is speaking up as a young emerging man to say, these are boundaries that ought not be violated, and this guy is doing it every day. And he calls Dr. L- he, he talked to his mom, which might there right there have been a mistake. And his mom says, well, let's call Dr. Laura and get on the radio. They call Dr. Laura, and she tells him that his desire to protect those boundaries is wrong. So what's going to happen to this guy? He's going to grow up. He's going to be a man who's full of shame, who cannot connect to his inner guidance and therefore cannot connect to his mission and cannot connect to those values that would power him to overcome obstacles. And, well, and one more thing to say about that. Men are not tough for toughness sake, but rather they appear tough when they endure whatever must be endured for the sake of a mission. Okay, they're not just like tough because it's good to be tough. They're tough because the mission requires it. And when we tell boys that they can't trust their inner guidance, their inner sense of mission, or their inner impulse to protect themselves and to establish and protect boundaries, we make them not more tough but ultimately less. We make them less capable of enduring because we make them less capable of connecting to a mission and to protecting boundaries. So, what all that is, the desire, his, this boy's desire to be, to get away from his coach, 
That's his natural alarm system going off in his body and in his mind telling him, it, it, hey, we need a man here, right? Uh, it's time to grow up and protect your boundaries because you're dealing with someone who's not respecting those, who's not behaving properly. So his desire to get away from that coach isn't a sign of an absence of masculinity. It's a sign of its presence. His natural masculine urge to protect himself from others who would hurt him is, has been now, after this conversation with Dr. Laura, has been shamed. And he was told to suppress that rather than to listen to it. So that's my basic analysis of this situation. The boy was told that he's weak and that the, and that the coach apparently was making him strong, making him a better soccer player. But, but in the end, that's impossible. The coach is not capable of making him strong. And why? Why do you, why, well, you might ask why um, the coach is incapable imp- of making him strong. Well, I'll tell you. The coach is incapable of making this boy strong because a man who routinely screams at, berates, belittles, or abuses boys in his care is making it quite clear that he is the weak one in this situation. So the central, the main way that men protect others on a day-to-day basis, given our level of emotional and physical strength, the way men protect each others on a day-to-day basis is through developing emotional self-control. And a coach who screams and yells and throws chairs or, in some cases, throws little boys into lockers, A coach who does those things and cannot find other ways to motivate his players, he's not modeling strength, he's modeling weakness. And a man that weak cannot teach boys to be strong. Dr. Laura's advice to the boy to just accept the abuse, he hurt that hurt not only the boy, but the coach in that situation. By encouraging the boy and the boy's mother to remove from the coach all accountability for his behavior, for his boundary violation, for his abusiveness. Had the boy's complaints been taken seriously, that coach would have been challenged to grow and mature as well as the boy would have been. The other problem with Dr. Laura's response, of course, is it's blood-curdling pragmatism. She's literally justifying the coach's behavior on the basis that it makes the boy a better soccer player. Well, I'm, so what? What good is it making him a better soccer player if the same behavior is making him a worse man? I wonder if Dr. Laura... It, what she would think if the coach was out there with a cattle prod, you know, one of those long sticks that you can electrify and you bump into the backside of a cow or whatever to get it to move. Well, what would happen when the boy ran the wrong way or kicked the wrong way or whatever, the coach just hit him on one of those? Would she accept that? Well, probably not. But the principle is here is the same. The principle of... What matters is the result, and whatever it takes to get that result is okay. So we have to ask, well, why is it okay to scream and yell and belittle a boy, but it's not okay to hit him with a cow prod? It's the same principle. It's just a matter of degree. And if you're going to endorse the principle, which clearly Dr. Laura does, and I, by the way, I hope it's clearly not, If you're going to endorse that principle that whatever is necessary to get the result you want is okay, well, where's the line? And how do you defend having a line at all? How do you say that the cattle prod is not okay, but the emotional damage is, or rather, but the emotional damaging behavior is okay? 
So why do we accept this from coaches, teachers, whoever? I mean, if the bully in this situation had been 13, we would have told the boy to, to stand up to him. We would have coached the boy to not to accept this kind of abuse from another child, another teenager. But we don't say that when it's a coach. And I think we do that for three, re- three or four reasons. You know, first it's because these bullies are adults. And we often just simply don't take kids' pain seriously. We live in a world where these kinds of behaviors on the parts of certain adults have been accepted for so long that we think it's normal. And most people cannot connect the epidemic of shame to the infrastructure of what we consider normal. You know, uh, when my gym teacher ended up throwing that kid, like I said, into the lockers a bunch, you know what happened to him as a consequence? Zilch. Zero. Nada. Nothing. I was called into the uh, guidance counselor's office a few days later to recount the story of what I had witnessed. And uh, the guidance counselor said, okay, well, we'll take care of it. Well, the guy taught in the school system for another 30 years and retired uh, with full benefits. Nothing happened. Why? Because we don't take kids' pain seriously. Why don't we take kids' pain seriously? Well, often it's because these bullies um, work for institutions that we don't want to question. We've been taught athletics develop character, regardless of whether that's true or not. We don't want to believe that uh, somebody who works for the school system where we send our kids every day might, in fact, be an abuser. Because if we accept that, we all, we, who knows where that might lead. Right? We also don't take kids' pain seriously because if we did and we were to take children and their concerns like that seriously, and we tried to hold the bully accountable, well, that would be awkward. Can you imagine the conversations that that would have to engender? And somebody could get fired, and that wouldn't be very, that would not be a good thing for a Friday. So, what would I have said to this kid if I, if he called me instead of calling Dr. Laura? Well, I'd say a few things. First, I'd say, listen to what your feelings are telling you. If you're feeling, I need to get away from this guy, those feelings, they ain't lying. That, Like I said, that's your inner alarm system going off and telling you that someone has breached your boundaries. Okay. Second, we got to understand the order of value. You don't accept abuse because it makes you a better soccer player. Uh, what you want to be in life, regardless of whether you're a good soccer player or not, is you want to be a man who values himself, who has self-respect, and who can hold his boundaries. And if you don't have that order of value right, well, you're lost. And you're going to be lost for years and years to come. Third, I would say to this boy, your call in this situation is to stand up to your coach. You don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to be offensive. In fact, you shouldn't be either of those things. But you can tell him that you don't like this behavior and that you're not going to tolerate it. Now, that's scary and it's risky. And we can, I would work with the kid. Let's find some good ways that you might be able to do it. But in the end, it's true that men are made in the doing of scary and risky things. They are made in this doing of scary and risky things, especially in defense of themselves, their boundaries, and their principles. That is how you become a man who's able to achieve a mission, who's able to protect himself and others. 
You become that by standing up to abuse, not by accepting it for the sake of some secondary and ultimately unimportant goal. Finally, I want to know from this kid, where is your dad? I mean, ideally in this situation, the boy's father would be guiding him through this, would be the one coaching him about how to speak to this adult, and would be standing behind him, if not physically, then emotionally and socially when it's the boy's time to tell the coach to tone it down. Having a father there to do that, that would actually give the boy a masculine ideal to aspire toward and one that shows and evinces strength and not weakness as the coach has been doing. So now some, of course, might object by saying that boys become men through initiation and making it through a a soccer season with a rough coach. That's part of the initiation that boys have to go through to become men. Well, here again, we have the right principle. I think that's probably true that boys become men through initiation. So we have the right principle, but we have the wrong application. And this is what I would want to tell this young boy. The test for him here is not to accept abuse, but to stand up to it. The crucible here in which his character and manhood will be most formed, and formed in a positive, healthy way, is not in simply accepting abuse, but in risking everything to stand up against it. That is his real initiation. And so, uh, what Dr. Laura ultimately did was to give this boy advice, which is going to shame him. It's going to create a fissure fissure in him between what he believes are other people's expectations and his own inner sense of what's right for him. And she gave him advice that would help him to avoid his real initiation into manhood. So, pretty destructive and terrible advice. That's my take. If you don't think that's right, well, then feel free to reach out. You can find me on Twitter, like I said. You can email me at dean at deanabbott.com. Let me know what you think. I look forward to hearing from you. And we'll be together again on the next episode of Plain Spoken. <laughs>